Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jay Tyler Odell. I am the president of the Graduate Religious Studies Initiative for Professional Development. And welcome to, I don't have a slide for this, but Religion and Pop Culture, Vampire, Demons, and Jesus. Oh, my. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming out today. I'd like to take a moment to thank the faculty of Religious Studies for supporting the creation of GRIP. Uh, and by extension, the creation of the Graduate Student Lecture Series. This is the first of the lecture series, and uh, we appreciate all the support. Today's topic, today we're going to hear from six graduate students and our guest lecturer on topics ranging from comic books to demons to dank memes. With that being said, let me allow me to introduce <laughs> Stephen Dolan, who will be speaking about religion and memes. Can everyone hear me okay? Do I need the microphone? People in the back, raise your hand if you can hear me. Oh, good. That also means you're responding. Uh, all right, so today, I'm here to warm you all up for this fantastic and invigorating lecture. So we're gonna talk about memes, because, I mean, let's face it, what do we do in our free time? Check Facebook, Instagram. Uh, I can't pronounce some of the names of the Instagram places that I follow, because I'm technically an institution giving a lecture. But memes are a great way that we love to laugh for all of about 30 seconds and then move on to the next one. So, that being said, memes is something that our generation uses as a way to communicate with one another. Maybe through ideas, maybe as jokes, critiques, all different types of stuff. So, what happens when religion, and yes, you see it around quotations, and I'm going to be talking about that later, when that goes as part of it, and I apologize if some of these are blurry, but yeah. So two things you don't talk about at the dinner table are what? I'm going to need a participant. Religion and politics. Fantastic. We're going to be breaking one of those today. <laughs> well, we're not at the dinner table, but. <laughs> so, it's noted within our society, especially within Western society and in the United States, we don't talk about religion. All right? Something that you keep to yourself. Treat your religion like your salary. Don't tell people, don't ask people. It's like something that's phallic, you keep it to yourself. <laughs> I, I wanted to post that on there, but I couldn't. Um, so that's something, but that's, well, what we need to pay attention to is, yes, while it is this joke, it's slowly starting to ingrain something into our minds. But you don't talk about it. Religion is individualized. It's based on the individual. At least that's how we interpret it. But the internet is a place in which all expression reigns, in which you have the freedom to post fake news if you want to troll somebody, to post jokes, about your religion, because not only does it make it relevant to today, by keeping it updated by making these types of jokes. On Good Friday, Jesus said it was, was all YOLO, then on Easter, he was all like JK. <laughs> Just kidding. There was another one where Jesus stands over his 12, disciple, his 12 disciples, saying Pontius Pilate said that I'm gonna crucify you, and then three days later I was like, nah, bro. Or my favorite. We have these memes where it's just in the most bizarre, like things appearing in the most bizarre places to do what? Talk about Jesus. And I'm sure many of you on this campus, especially in front of Cooper, um, have, exper have experienced just the lavishness of um, people stopping to you and wanting to talk to you about religion. Now that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, because if I did, then I'd be going back to this. <coughs> I'd be going back to a spot where religion is something that can't even be talked about whatsoever, and that's troubling in some cases. For us, religion, when you look at it in the myriad, for the different genesis, the usual suspects, religion is something that makes up our entire framework of what reality is. And yet, in the United States, we're meant to keep this to ourselves. But we express it anyways, and I love it, because it makes for really good jokes. And in some cases, religion works as a way of kind of like rationalizing things that within the religion we're actually not sure about. If you, especially if you talk about um, rationalism, 
and then you have the, the, you know, the, the feud between evolution and creationism being taught in school. Uh, so you have this meme that comes out now of like the famous boss throwing somebody out of a window. My best creation, that's what God's saying, is human. People are like, cool, super. And yeah, the guy's like, dinosaurs were better. So he gets thrown out of a window and then you have Lucifer. I'm not saying that this is a legitimate way that which people describe this is how Satan became a thing. <laughs> but we have here is someone made an artistic image of what a somewhat could be like origin story of Lucifer. Because we had that already in the back of our minds. So religion and memes reveal something else to us. That religion is deeply embedded into our culture. That we are aware that Lucifer's start came with being cast out of heaven. Now there are, now there of course within the religious tradition, there is a different narrative. It was because Lucifer said that dinosaurs were better that he got cast out of the building and turned into Lucifer, but that he had gone against God. What we have here, again is what I mentioned earlier, is we have religion becoming more relevant, using memes as a way to kind of globalize itself on the internet, but also showing that it's still as relevant as Kanye. But religion also takes another route when we're on the internet, and a lot of it is a critique. Now, this is what I want you to understand as I continue on with this conversation. When I'm saying religion, I'm not talking about anyone in particular. I'm not condemning any of them. I'm not pointing towards any of them. What I want us to look at today is the term religion. What do we mean when we say it? What does it connotate? How does it translate? And do we have any potential biases with how we were brought up? <coughs> All right. I don't have a lot of time. We're gonna have to speak through this. <laughs> and how this works. So the first hint that we have, religion is negative on its own to the point that somebody who identifies as a Christian would actually disassociate themselves as being religious. I am not, I hate religion, but I love Jesus. There was actually once, I don't know if it's still there, but there's a billboard over by Mosey that said that Christianity is not a religion, Christianity is a relationship with God. We also have religious people as being irrational. One does not simply take religious people seriously, or that it's typically all the same thing, which is praying to a deity. More so, religion is something that's based on beliefs. Even to the point that religious people, you just can't bargain with them. To the point that a meme made out by philosophical atheism points out that no amount of belief makes something a fact. Or that religion is something that you can be like, are you religious? What's your religion? A picture of a caterpillar? I'm interested in it. This one's a little bit tougher. Like, a little bit tougher to swallow. Religion's Bible. Inherently, if your religion is worth killing something over, that's a rough thing to say. Please start with yourself. Or that if your religion requires you to hate someone, then you need a new religion. But how does that translate when you have things like the Caribbean religions who used religion as a way to unite themselves to overthrow their slave masters? Or religion is inherently good. There is no such thing as bad religion, only bad people. And the 99.9% .9 of religious people who aren't obnoxious nut jobs toast to you. <laughs> but even in these critiques, we still see a dichotomy. That religion makes or outlines that which is good or evil. And so what do we compile when we look at how religions are represented in memes, which for us are our way that we express our beliefs, just completely out there, <coughs> unfiltered for how we perceive the world? Religion starts to look like something that's privatized, a system of beliefs, ethics, that involves prayer or ritual specifically to a deity or supernatural force. Show of hands, what does that sound like? Again, I'm not saying anything bad. Is it anyone? Huh? Enlightenment era religion, but typically, folks, let's remember where we come from. We come from, the, and I'm not being trite, I promise, I'm not being negative. But this is something that as we continue, both for today, and also as you continue on to your lives and your careers, 
How do we interpret religion, especially when we look through the news, especially when we read journal articles, or if we listen to the radio? In our Western mindsets, religion often takes the place of what we view Christianity to be. That's not a bad thing. In fact, for the most part, Christianity is in fact religion. But, what I mean to say, and I apologize if I'm stammering a little bit, but what I mean to say is that as we look at other religions in the world and as we look at the histories, when we divide the world in a way that religion is supposed to look like this way, it might in fact be a negative way. We could end up misinterpreting people's beliefs in a way through our own lens and not be able to include them. Or we could shame religions for taking certain actions that we may not see because of our Western mindset. Now, I'm not here to persuade you or change anything. My only goal here today was to just get you thinking. Get you thinking about what do you think when you see the word religion? And to instead of just accept it as, well, I know when I see it, just like in the definition of what a meme is, I know when I see it. We just think a little bit harder about it. Please give a round of applause to introduce Roberto Rosa. will analyze anime as a learning tool students can use to understand Eastern religions. Although we have plenty of fascinating scholarly publications explaining how the sacred influence American pop culture, little work has been done on Japanese pop culture and its relationship with the sacred. Jolan Baraka Thomas has contributed to this area of study and explains that this area of study is still in its infancy. Thomas argues that manga and anime make religion relevant to a modern audience. So, I'm going to go ahead and turn the image. Here we have Goku from Dragon Ball Z, or Dragon Ball, the whole Dragon Ball series. Um, if any of you ever plan on taking an intro to religious studies course, you'll have the opportunity to learn about animism, which Robert Elward defines as a belief that everything in nature has a soul or spirit, and that therefore all existence involves the widespread presence of spirit beings, both of the departed and of the animated objects. Allow me to demonstrate how this belief is reflected through the art of modern pop culture artist Akira Toriyama, the creator of Dr. Slump and Dragon Ball series. The influence of Akira Toriyama's character Goku, who struggles with his search for strength and power, can easily be traced back to ancient Buddhist stories, most notably the journey to the West. The Chinese <coughs> monkey king, who defeated many demons and even forced his way into heaven, served as the archetype for Goku. So here we have uh, Goku, Kid Goku, and if you can see he has his tail, he's flying on the Nimbus, and all this. Uh, that's the Monkey King. He's from uh, Chinese uh, folklore. So uh, 
the Monkey King and Goku have a lot of uh, commonalities, and one of them being the Flying Nimbus, also the uh, staff. Uh, Goku uses uh, some magic staff to help him beat up demons, and lo and behold, the Monkey King has one also. But the interesting thing about these, uh, these, this character is that it's all, it's all based on some kind of ancient uh, story from Buddhist heritage. That's the Nimbus, who is a good, serves as a perfect expression as, uh, to, to describe animism. Uh, it's an inanimate object that pretty much acts like a character of its own within the series uh, and within uh, Journey to the West. So, in modern cinematic re renditions of Journey to the West, the Nimbus makes many appearances, along with the Buffalo King, his daughter, which are paralleled in Akira Toriyama's work as the Buffalo King and Chi Chi, and although their stories are not identical, there are many parallels, steering the fan base to the source of their influence, Chinese literature. So this is Goku and all of his different stages. If, if you guys get a chance to watch The Journey to the West, you'll get to see uh, the Monkey King's character looking very human in the, in, the, in the introductory stages of the story, and then look further on to the story, you get that image that I just displayed where he had this uh, kind of like a monkey look to him and his hair is golden, so this golden hair is also um, parallel to the Monkey King. So, this relates, I need to uh, jump into the, the latest series of the Dragon Ball Saga, Dragon Ball Super, which uh, Goku has finally achieved a, a rank of divinity. Um, they literally make him a god. So this is him standing uh, around his friends and family, and they are elevating him to a divine position in the whole story of uh, the Dragon Ball Saga. This relates to Japanese Shinto in many ways. Most notable is Goku's divination. It, it's, uh, it's related to the Shinto um, ancestor worship. So majority of these people are related to Goku in some way and, and they are raising him up to divinity. Uh, much like uh, in Shinto culture, uh, you, uh, the, the members of the tradition will uh, serve reverence to their ancestors. Uh, they will make prayers um, and they keep them in their remembrance forever. So, this brief lecture purpose is to facilitate more discoveries of parallels between Eastern artists and Western uh, aspects of stories. <coughs> And Toriyama, the creator of Dragon Ball, has integrated his culture into his art. This is important because new, innovative, attention-grabbing ways to teach Far East religions are always beneficial for all parties involved. Thank you. Next we have Mutaki Kamal. Hello. Good afternoon. So I'll talk about another controversial thing in the pop culture, which is indigenous religion. Historically, it's been a controversial one and 
we have done so many things about it, you know. To start with, let's play a game. The game is, can anybody tell me what is this? Shrunken head. Okay. This is a shrunken head or a sansa. Now, here comes the important question. Who made these things? Or where is it from? Option A, Africa. Option B, or two, Asia. Three, South America. And four, the bus from Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> Who goes for four? How many hands we have for four? <laughs> okay. Any other options? Okay. I'm going to say South America. Okay. How many of us say South America? Well, good. So, both are correct. <laughs> this particular head is from the bus of Harry Potter when he was escaping, but this head is actually made by the Jival or Shuar people of Ecuador. And these are actually actual human heads, shrunken into a little ball, okay? Now, usually in the pop culture, we will see it is related. It, uh, a connection with voodoo or magic is drawn with the shrunken heads. But, interestingly, they do not have any magical connections. They have a religious implication that, religious and social implication, that the Shur or the Jevaro people believed that if they can fetch the head of their rival tribe's headman, or their rivals, it will give them the spiritual power to dominate over them. It also shows the social dominance over the rivals. But they don't throw some kind of like voodoo powers over people and do things with these heads. They just serve the religious and social purpose. Now, this is the point <coughs> of the representation of indigenous religions in pop culture. What we do, we misrepresent most of the time in the um, mainstream pop culture or culture in two ways. First, the first way is to project them as demonic, savage, dangerous, and always the peculiar ri rituals. For example, Sansa. The Jivaros have for example, Jivaros have great uh, enriched history and cultural backgrounds. We don't talk about them. We know them for the Sansas. We don't know, most of, uh, a lot of people do not know, that they were the only tribe that the Spanish or the Portuguese were not able to defeat. They were huge fighters, warriors. Okay, and she's, she's excited. I like that. So, and the other way to represent them is the angelic other. Like they know about stuff, they know about like spiritual things, they can heal you. They can give you some like when you uh, amputate yourself, they'll give you some like leaves and you'll grow back your hands or legs and something. And for example, the deities in Moana in Disney, I was talking to Robert about it, Disney, the depiction of Pocahontas while the history was completely different. Mm -hmm. This is the thing. We project them as the other. As a result, we strip them of their normality. We seek for their peculiarities while we meet them in the reality, while we meet them in person. I have, from my personal experience, I have seen people, indigenous tribes, who were asked by the tourists and the travelers that, do you eat human? The first question, you go to a tribe, 
You ask them, do you eat human? They are, no. So they show in the TV and the cartoons that you do that. No, we don't. We eat vegetables. <laughs> For example, one of the foods they eat. So, they have been called the heathen. They have been called the... <coughs> Try to be explained through the mainstream narratives of religion, where they have, there is significant difference between the mainstream religions and the indigenous religions. We haven't dealt into the conceptual realm of the indigenous people, to some extent, academically yet. So while we are projecting and representing them in pop culture, we are trying to show the sellable parts, what we can sell, what will catch our eyes <coughs> in pop culture, from their culture. And they, in many cases, they are linked to witchcraft, Voodoo, once again, comes here. Indians, uh, how many of you have watched Indiana Jones' Temple of Doom? A lot, yeah. Like, Omresh Puri over there, <laughs> says Kali Ma Sakti Dei, like, you know, praying to Kali, the goddess, fetching the, like, stripping out the heart of a guy and eating it. Yeah, from, like, I'm from subcontinent, I can say I never saw anybody do that. <laughs> <laughs> this is commonly the representation of the indigenous religion that we try to project them as exotic, as, as different, and as peculiar. And to know them, we have to come out of them. All right, up next we have Rob Beckett. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name's Rob Beckett. I'm finishing up my undergraduate degree in religious studies. Uh, my area of focus involves the way that popular culture emulates and takes on elements of religious devotion. Uh, the work I'm presenting on today, uh, it's been an ongoing project for several semesters with Dr. Lockler, uh, and it deals ultimately with the religious elements of role-playing games. Uh, okay, so the thing doesn't work. <laughs> So a role-playing game involves the creation of a fictional character within a framework of rules. Uh, players then act out those characters to success or failure. Um, most of you are probably passingly familiar with role-playing games. You've played cowboys and Indians, you've played heroes or princesses. Um, these are the things that we grow up with in our lives. For the last three semesters, I've studied how voodoo is represented in White Wolf's Game Studios' World of Darkness role-playing system. Uh, in this game world, the players take on the roles of, uh, of vampires, sorcerers, ghosts, and several other supernatural creatures. This project specifically is focusing on vampire sorcerers and ghosts. In summer of 2017, I wrote a paper for Dr. Lockler. That began this project. It dealt with the representation of voodoo in the game Vampire the Masquerade. 
Uh, the game itself is predicated upon the concept that vampires are descended from, uh, from the son of Adam, the, fir uh, the first son, the first murderer, the biblical Cain. Uh, cursed by God to walk the earth for all time, and then later by archangels, uh, he became the first vampire. From Cain descended uh, multiple clans and bloodlines of vampires, each clan or bloodline uh, being sort of like a family. Uh, they share and pass down traits from sire to child. Uh, the bloodline I focused on are the zombies. Uh, they are presented as mercenaries who sell themselves to the highest bidder and who practice uh, voodoo in pursuit of their own goals. Uh, the overall representation is a caricature of the Baron Zombie, uh, where he is both, uh, both vulgar and mischievous. Uh, there's always a purpose to his actions. There's always something beneficial to what he's bringing to the celebration. Uh, the zombie bloodline, on the other hand, are really only in it for themselves. Uh, they have little to no care for, for the mortals, for the people who may be part of the voodoo uh, religion in their area. Now, this misrepresentation of faith uh, continues when we move to the game Wraith the Oblivion. Uh, this game presents ghosts as the characters that you play, and it builds its fiction based loosely on the work of Carl Jung. Uh, wraith characters are presented with a psyche, uh, which is normally portrayed by the character. It's your, uh, your overall being, your driving goal. Uh, and the shadow, which the player will portray at uh, often in opportune times. Uh, the purpose of the shadow is to drag the psyche into oblivion or final destruction. Uh, that doesn't fit in the manner that the respected dead are perceived in the African tribal religions. Uh, so when White Wolf made rules for the Loa available for play, they didn't do so in a very flattering manner. Uh, the Loa presented in the game world, much like the Baron Zombie, uh, were presented as caricatures of what they really are. But worse, they were presented more as evil. Uh, this misrepresentation is not uncommon for White Wolf and they've regularly misrepresented the cultures that they draw their inspiration from. Now, I do have to say, in the last several years, this has begun to change. Uh, one example of that change is the Bata. Uh, the Bata are introduced to us in Mage the Ascension's 20th Anniversary Edition. Uh, they're a group of sorcerers who have a shared magical paradigm uh, revolving around New Orleans-style voodoo. Uh, this craft is treated with respect. It's treated with appreciation for the culture that produces the archetypes that they're based on. Uh, I think of particular note is that the lead author of Mage the Ascension, Phil Tricado, um, has spoken to the efforts the company is now making toward a more respectful approach to the, cultural, uh, to the culturally sensitive issues that they cover. And uh, he's acknowledged that in 1993, when this game was first presented, that they didn't have the same wealth of information, they didn't have the same ability to gather information that perhaps we do today in 2017. I think that that says a lot about the company and future representations of culturally sensitive topics. That brings us up to where I'm at now. Uh, continuing research is moving me away from the game world and the characters that we portray in the game world toward a comparison of the elements of the game and religious observance. So as with many religions, uh, there are books that players consider sacred, uh, literally hundreds of them produced by White Wolf. Uh, players gather in the same place each week or um, in the day or the night uh, respective to the game. Um, they gather on the same day of the week, much like you would when you're going to church or when you're going to a religious observance of your own. Uh, the similarities continue on and on from there, and sadly, uh, Tyler just showed me I have two minutes left. So uh, we're going to talk just for a second about Victor Turner. Um, he explored liminality and its importance to the continuing uh, development of this work. Uh, if liminal space is that place mid-ritual, where we truly open ourselves up to the divine and the influence of the divine, role players may inhabit this space 
far more frequently than do you or I. Do players like Voodoo Assange open themselves up to a deeper experience? Uh, many would argue that yes, they do. Uh, they would say that their characters may even take on a life of their own. If this is true, who are we to say that their experience is invalid? Uh, who are we to say that the meaning that they draw from these experiences are less than those drawn in a voodoo ceremony or even in some Christian services? That's what I hope to find out um, as I continue this project through the end of the semester. Thank you. Let me to introduce Vincent McCoy. So far, we. Oh, okay. All right. Oh. <laughs> here. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, so far, we've heard uh, exclusively from graduate students from the Religious Studies Department. Uh, Vincent McCoy is actually a graduate student from the Philosophy Department. let this fool you into thinking I'm better with technology. I'm showing a YouTube video halfway through and it's in two parts because that's apparently how YouTube works. Also, a little commentary on <laughs> previous presenters. Uh, um, anyway, uh, I'll come back to uh, my actual presentation. Now, um, I'm, t <laughs> sorry. Um, today I'm, t I'm talking about uh, the echoes of Christianity and Christian culture in modern popular culture. Um, that we live in an age and a culture today where the, the echoes and the themes of Christianity, the Christian myth, are so pervasive that we don't notice them. So I'm going to start off telling a story. So listen here and see if you recognize uh, what I'm talking about here. So the hero and his friends are facing defeat from the villain. This is at the climax of the story, just before it ends. The hero, instead of overcoming the villain by some feat of power, allows himself to be defeated in order to save those he loves. In the end, this defeat at the hands of the villain winds up being the villain's undoing, and the hero is ultimately victorious. Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Okay, right? Harry confronts Voldemort. He allows Voldemort to kill him, and that ultimately leads to Voldemort's destruction. Now, that's, that's perfectly true. Or, on the other hand, am I retelling the story of Luke Skywalker, who at the end of Return of the Jedi surrenders to the Emperor, throws away his lightsaber, and refuses to kill his father, and in the throes of defeat, winds up being victorious. Or, maybe, I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus, God became man, who decides to allow himself to be killed, to enter into death itself, to save those he loves, the human race. So, I want to show one particular example from a perhaps unexpected place, somewhere we wouldn't, ex wouldn't necessarily expect to find uh, such a, uh, a bit of Christian mythology or Christian symbolism. Uh, and that is um, from, in this case, from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, of all things, Thor. So this is the part where there's two pieces because of something to do with copyright, I'm guessing. So I apologize, and I also apologize for the, for the camera. This is probably going to get demonetized. Okay. <laughs> How do you think this is going to end? 
And well, here's the next part. <laughs> Conveniently, the clip ends. So let's go. Whoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. surprising similarity between, no, thanks for that. Um, between this book from a movie which is supposed to portray a comic book superhero as a figure from Norse mythology, the Norse god of thunder. But in a couple, of, in, in at least a couple of cases, he is one minor mistranslation away from quoting the gospel. Right? It, it's over, it's finished, right? Same thing. Right there, throughout this entire scene, we see essentially a depiction of the story of Christ. In fact, this story would be incredibly alien to the Thor that we see in the Eddas, the traditional mythological <coughs> Norse god of thunder. Um, a god who comes to earth, is stripped of his power, who willingly sacrifices himself, making himself weak in this way, in order to save those he loves. Now, yes, uh, traditionally in mythology, Thor does uh, die to save people, but he dies in battle. It is a stark difference. And this, this image of Thor we have, yes, it strikes us as a typical story of a typical hero, but it would strike someone familiar with Thor, the god, as bizarre perhaps unrecognizable. And Thor isn't the only example of this even in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We also have, uh, for example, this is the last, that's the only clip I'm gonna share, I'm sorry. Uh, we have Iron Man in the Avengers, where he rides a nuclear weapon into what is basically hell itself through this wormhole, defeating the enemies that are threatening the people he loves, threatening Manhattan, almost dying in the process. And he comes back all the stronger. We have Captain America, Steve Rogers, where his go-to technique for fighting people stronger than him is to get punched until the person who's punching him can't do it anymore. I can do this all day. <laughs> and maybe the most prototypically, we've got Doctor Strange, whose method of victory is to go into the domain of what is effectively Satan, 
and be defeated over and over and over again for all eternity so that eventually he comes away victorious. Like Dormado has become the bargain. All of these examples are, I hesitate to say unintentional, but certainly not intended to be Christ figures. Even if they are, they're very strongly types of Christ figure. Now, this one in particular, the case of Thor. This is as far as you can probably get from somebody trying to put some hero to look like Christ into a comic book movie. Right? But it's so deeply embedded in our own culture that we don't, we recognize it as the hero, but we don't recognize it as Christ, this, this prototypical example of the hero that's fundamental and foundational to our culture. What we do recognize it is, we recognize it as a hero. Now, what may be even more fascinating is we may not even recognize this type, this Christ figure, if we're writing it, especially uh, people in a modern, secularized West. So what can we take away from this? Well, the chief implication, I think, is that we, as a culture, are not any longer consciously Christian. We don't write Christ figures, and when we do, they don't turn out quite right. So if you look at Man of Steel, with the almost constant use of Christian imagery <coughs> of Superman floating away from the ship cruciform and such, right? The imagery is there, but the substance is missing. Whereas when it, where it's unintentional, where we only seek to portray the hero as heroic, we wound up making Christ figures, where one was never intended in the first place. So I think what we can see here is that what remains of Christianity in our culture is still incredibly fundamental in our cultural milieu, but it's no longer conscious. We only see it through the lens of the everyday. So this, I hadn't planned on connecting this to our discussion of indigenous religion or our discussion of memes or any of the other discussions, but. Um, it becomes a sort of us. It seems so familiar just because it is familiar. It doesn't seem odd or different. And when we try and look at it from the outside, then it looks strange. So that wasn't the ending I was, uh, I was planning on. But I think it's a good point to wrap on. So that's all, that's all I've got. And I think the rest of the speaking on movie The Conjuring from 2013. Horror movies such as The Conjuring like to warp the truth for cinematic effect. In the film, the Perrin family, the main characters of the film, uh, is plagued by a monstrosity called Bathsheba. To combat this demonic force, the family reached out to the only ones that could help them, a demonologist and trance medium duo named The Warrens. The Warrens were hesitant to perform an exorcism, but they eventually did. By defeating Bathsheba, they show good conquered over evil. The Warrens were the heroes of the story when the church turned its back on the family. Yesterday, I sat down with the eldest daughter of the Perrins family, Andrea Perrin. We spoke about the discrepancies between the film and real life, such as how the Perrins only went to the church to ask for help. No one else. But the Warrens showed up to their door because a neighbor tipped them off. The climax of the movie, the exorcism scene, never happened. The film paints the family as non-religious, and to quote Andrea herself, <laughs> well, non-religious, when in reality they were practicing Catholics. The story the film was based on occurred in the early 70s. So what's the difference between American religious life then and now? According to the Pew Research Center and General Social Survey, those who have reported attending church at least weekly has dropped significantly from 1974 to 2012. Pew's Religious Landscape Study shows those attending just 
from 2007 to 2013, six years, dropped another 30%. Also, in March of 2015, the GSS released, released a press summary stating that fewer, fewer Americans affiliate with organized religion. What this means is from 19, the early 1970s to 2012, 2013, an accumulation of factors including changing culture, perception of the church, views of the world, have changed in such a way that it accounts for a consistent amount of people leaving the church, or at least attending less, since 1973. <coughs> this relates to the movie not only because it's set in 1971, but because it shows a depiction of religiosity many in our society are used to seeing today. The Conjuring and similar movies are changing their settings to reflect modern religious activity rather than being true to the time period. Most importantly, however, is that this survey states all those who participated, uh, let me back up, all those who participated in the survey have, pardon me. What's important is that there was a sharp increase in non-religious activity over a 24 year period. The people who identified as non-religious are most likely coming in equal amounts from religious traditions, all religious traditions, which means that because Christianity has been the dominant religion in America, most will be coming for Christianity. The bottom line of what I'm saying here is from the 1970s to 2013, the amount of people who identified themselves as strong practicing Christians dropped from about 75% to 35%. According to Cohen's book, Monster Theory, media and extension film is a reflection of cultures fears, hopes, and desires. America's religious landscape is shifting dramatically. We're looking more towards other religious authorities like the Warrens than of religious authorities that have ruled for thousands of years. When films like The Conjuring are, quote, 95% made up, they're reflecting the rapid change of America's religious landscape in a way that drill, draws crowds and millions of dollars. I had to speed that up because we're running low on time. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Dr. Michael Hayes. He is currently an assistant professor at Lycoming College. His latest book, Holy Monsters, Sacred Grotesques, is due out by the end of this year with Lexington Books. to get you out of here in a timely manner, which is going to require clipping out some of my stuff on the fly. That's perhaps um, just fun to say. Uh, <laughs> so, So, uh, by way of skipping, can everybody hear me all right? Great. Uh, by way of skipping the first two pages, uh, I became interested in The Exorcist in particular because Michael Taneo writes in his book, American Exorcism, that The Exorcist is really the genesis point of the return of exorcistic practice inside of America, um, to the tune of hundreds, if not thousands, of people receiving exorcisms every year. Um, he notes that despite the fact that we may not know it, exorcism is a business, and business is booming. Um, I started looking around, and <laughs> I discovered that no one had really written on this topic, that there was really no one who was interested in the effect of this film, why it continued to be of such enduring popularity. It still remains um, the number one horror film in terms of gross. Um, and why the subgenre of possession films seems particularly long-lived. Um, so I decided that I would research it. So while I do not intend to come to the notion that the film is capable of being read as a sign of the time, that is that we can locate ultimately um, the reason for its popularity in the era that it was made, I believe that the enduring popularity of the film after the passage of 
such events like Vietnam and Watergate, and the creation of arguably an entire subgenre of horror in the wake of the exorcist is caused to dig deeper. As I will argue in this piece, we can only account for this continued popularity, both of the exorcist, the subgenre, and of exorcism itself, if we read the film as a medical drama. Moreover, I believe in doing so, the importance and impact of the study of pop culture, and why we're all here today, can be uniquely highlighted. Most interesting is the film's odd effect upon a portion of its audience. As McCormick wrote in 1974, it is certain that most people have accepted The Exorcist as nothing more than a good, rousing, scary movie. However, there have been numerous reports of everything from fainting and vomiting in the theaters to nightmares, religious conversion, and mental breakdowns attributed to the film. People have been driven to psychiatrists, to various and sundry faith healers, exorcists, necromancers, to the Catholic Church, or even to the devil cults, perhaps, in the theory that if you can't beat them, join them. For a film that, considering its loathsome constant, could probably not even have been made until recently, that is quite a track record. Quite a track record indeed, and a track that takes the impact of the exorcist out of pop culture and into, I will argue, the professional realm. Specifically, I will argue that The Exorcist not only changed the way that popular audiences viewed exorcism, but also created a, a debate within the field of psychology with regard to its own relationship to exorcistic practices. That is, the number of individuals adversely affected by the film, as well as the popular perception of this impact, caused professionals in the field to, of psychology to reassess their relationship with this ancient religious practice. In order to accomplish both of these ends, I have broken this talk into three parts. In the first two parts, I will address The Exorcist as a medical drama and provide an analysis of the film along these lines. And there will be clips. I will then move to the reception of The Exorcist in the 70s among four groups, lay populist critics, <coughs> religious practitioners, and mental health professionals. Friedkin's The Exorcist in 1973 was based on the book by the same name authored by William Peter Blatty and originally intended as a documentary work of an exorcism that was reported in 1949. Bloody's efforts shifted towards fiction after his request for further information from the family were rebuffed. In this new work, Blatty tells, Blatty tells the now familiar story of a young girl possessed by a demon and the two priests who came to her rescue. Freakin's work changes little from Blatty's original in broad strokes. For those unfamiliar with the movie, go now, watch it, I'll wait. <laughs> oh, we got 30 minutes? 30, 30 minutes, okay. Uh, or for the purpose of brevity, I'll just recount it here. 12-year-old Reagan is the daughter of actress Chris McNeil, both of whom are living in location in Washington, D.C., as Chris is wrapping up a movie. Chris discovers that she has been playing with a Ouija board, as she being uh, Linda Blair, uh, Reagan, claims to have contacted an entity called Captain Howdy. Chris assumes that this is nothing more than her daughter's imagination, but Reagan's behavior becomes increasingly erratic in the wake of this incident. During a party, she urinates on the carpet, pronounces a death sentence on one of the guests, and afterwards her bed shakes violently while she lies upon it. Chris turns to a series of physicians and psychologists, all of whom are incapable of aiding Reagan until finally one offhandedly suggests that her daughter might benefit from an exorcism. It is here that our narrative links with Father Damien Carras, a Jesuit psychiatrist trained at all the top schools in the United States, or as Carras puts it, Harvard, Bellevue, Johns Hopkins, places like that. He is also a priest without faith, Throughout the film, he struggles with his relationship with God and the supernatural, arguably until the climactic moment of the story, when he is persuaded by Chris to assess her condition and plead for an exorcism. It is then that the second priest makes his appearance in D.C., Father Lancaster Marin Max von Sydow. Um, Marin, we come to understand, is actually the unnamed priest that the film opens upon in an archaeological dig in Iran. As Marin enters the home, a painfully deep voice can be heard howling his name. While Karis seems to shrug this off and offers to familiarize Marin with the case, the elder priest rejects this offer with a simple, why? And prepares himself for the exorcism. Later, when Karis insists he has identified three personalities manifesting themselves in Reagan, Marin replies, there is only one. The last half hour of the film represents the showdown between the demonic entity inside of Reagan and the two priests, from levitating beds to visual hallucinations to vomit the demon throws up everything that it has at the two priests until Marin dies, presumably of a heart attack. And upon seeing Marin dead, Karis savagely attacks the giggling demon and demands that it enters him instead. After the demon obliges, Karis throws himself down these intimidating steps, and they are mutually destroyed. Broadly speaking, the film is a gothic production. Victoria Nelson claims it for her new Gothic in the chapter Faux Catholic of Gothica, in which she notes that the exorcist is part of a peculiar but common paradox in the new Gothic. 
Roger C. Schloben in the inaugural issue of the Journal of the Fantastic and the Arts, claiming the exorcist for a brand of the Gothic that he labeled the deep horror. A categorization later abutted, but not the film's Gothic roots itself, by Robert F. Geary in the same publication five years later. Geary's work is a particularly good inroad into the Gothic element. I will quote extensively here. In the classic Victorian tale of supernatural terror, a complacent, normal, secular world experiences the intrusions of some supernatural element, which is all the more powerful because the characters do not suspect what they are confronting. The intrusions mount to an explosion of terror, which overturns the original materialistic mindset, leaving a sense that what reality contains is larger and darker than the legacy of the Enlightenment would have us believe. For simple illustration, recall the opening section of Dracula, where Jonathan Harker, the conventional, rational Englishman, descends into a nightmare which shatters his smug sense of superiority to the superstitions of the Eastern European peasants. This pattern is then repeated until finally they are forced to learn from the scientist supernaturalist Van Helsing, who claims, ah, there are things which you cannot understand and yet which are. It is the fault of our science that it wants to explain all, <laughs> and if it cannot explain, it says there is nothing to explain. In The Exorcist, we have all the hallmarks of Dracula, physicians who rationalize the supernatural with the smug superiority of the Enlightenment, a horrifying break with what can be rationally explained, and a retreat from rationalism so as to defeat the enemy. However, contrary to Dracula, the problem is not that doctors cannot explain a supernatural ailment with, that, with a natural medical diagnosis, but rather that they can mistake a supernatural ailment for a natural one and remain confident in their mistaken diagnosis. Indeed, the doctors that attend Reagan remain confident in their capacity to diagnose Reagan unto the end. In their final dialogue before the exit stage left, a colloquium of doctors discusses their findings with Chris. I will skip this dialogue. Instead, um, what I would characterize as a shading grin for one of the doctors I display here, when he says, it's pretty much discarded these days, referring to exorcism, except by the Catholics who keep it in the closet as sort of an embarrassment. It has worked, in fact, although not for the reason they think, of course. Purely force of suggestion. Of course, it does eventually turn out that she is possessed. <laughs> Um, it is precisely this confidence that I argue gives The Exorcist its teeth. Uh, careful attention to the cinematic language of the film and the construction of medicine within it reveals a medical establishment attempting to cover its own ignorance with painful tests and diagnostic mantras, opening a space for the demonic to speak. With regard to diagnosis, that the medical practitioners of The Exorcist follow a simple pattern. Reagan suffers from a symptom. The symptom is confidently explained by the doctors after which a test is performed which suggests the doctors are mistaken and or Reagan experiences a more dramatic symptom yet. The first symptom of Reagan's possession that draws her mother's attention is the night of Chris's party. It's a solid white nightclub with me as the headliner for all eternity. Love me. Love me. Chris then apologizes to her guests and tells them Reagan has been sick. Later, as Reagan is put to bed, she asks Chris, what's wrong with me? Chris, speaking as a proxy for the doctors, replies, it's just like the doctor said. It's nerves, and that's all, okay? You just take your pills, and you'll be fine. Really. Not long after, Reagan manifests a new and more extreme symptom, the shaking of her bed.
prompts a medical visit in which Reagan swears profusely at the attending physician, Dr. Klein, and is injected with an unknown substance, presumably a sedative. Chris displays the same faith in the medical establishment that she did in the first set of symptoms. When Reagan screams that she does not want the drugs, Chris tells her, honey, it's to help you. However, this faith is somewhat shaken when Dr. Klein approaches her with his diagnosis. Well, it's a symptom of a type of disturbance in the chemical electrical activity of the brain. In the case of your daughter in the temporal lobe, it's up here in the lateral part of the brain. Mm -hmm. It's rare, but it does cause bizarre hallucinations, and usually just before a convulsion. A convulsion? The shaking of the bed. That's doubtless due to muscular spasms. Oh, no, 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 that was no spasm. Look, I got on the bed. The whole bed was bumping and rising up the floor and shaking, the whole thing, with me on it. Mrs. McNeil, the problem with your daughter is not her bed. It's her brain. Chris's objection to the suggestion that the bed was shaking due to spasms indicates a breach in the doctor's authority. Chris rejects this portion of the diagnosis due to her personal experience of the symptom. Yet the doctor's authority is restored through a, through a patient but dismissive verbal gesture. Mrs. McNeil, the problem with your daughter is not her bed, it's her brain. Chris's small nod indicates that she accepts this diagnosis, if only half-heartedly. The doctor then proceeds to discuss this diagnosis and next steps with Chris, a process that cinematically also sets up Reagan's more aggressive behavior as normative for her condition. Specifically, Klein notes, it isn't rare to find destructive, even criminal behavior an individual suffering from her condition. The next scene is the angiography scene. With regard to its purpose, a beautifully constructed cinematic sequence. I'll show it here and then unpack. Regan, can you sit up, scoot over here?
see you again. Excuse me, doctor. Chris McNeil is on the phone. She says it's urgent. You got some time? Here we feel the effects of two truisms in the study of cinema, that we identify with the main characters of the film as if they were ourselves, and that close-ups are meant to convey emotion as opposed to, say, long or medium shots which primarily convey facts and information about a scene. A weary Reagan is affixed to the table, and close-ups allow us to see the medical equipment as Reagan is strapped in. Her facial expression betrays discomfort. A close-up of the syringe resolves into Chris's worried expression. The needle enters and Reagan winces sharply in pain. An array of medical equipment, all with painful possibilities, is panned over until the doctor selects his next tool, another thin needle. The audience witnesses the close-up of the needle slowly being lowered to touch the skin and the doctor's arm jerking forward. Another close-up of Reagan's pained face followed by another of Chris's worried expression. Blood, blood gets everywhere, and then a thin tube is threaded into Reagan's neck. A set of intimidating machines is placed around Reagan, who now has her eyes closed, presumably in fear. We see that one of the machines even appears to have extensive paint chimping or rusting around the borders, uh, giving it a weathered, old appearance. We receive a medium short shot of Reagan's face as she screams in pain, a change from our close-up, an essential one to convey the fact that the machines are the cause of Reagan's extreme distress. All for nothing, no results. Yet this is the conceit of the film regarding the medical establishment. The doctors believe that they have the answer to Reagan's malady, and they subject her to painful test after painful test that they are to prove that they are correct. At the same time, the audience is reminded through close-ups and candid shots between Reagan and Chris that Reagan is not an object to be tested, but a human being who fears and hurts and suffers. Viewers adopt the position of Reagan and or Chris, not only empathizing, but on some level sympathizing with their fame, just as I saw many audience members doing as they watched. <laughs> This sequence continues to play out again and again in the film, reinforcing a core message that juxtaposes the confidence of the medical establishment with their inability to correctly diagnose and cure Reagan. This tension can be seen in our next two scenes, in which Reagan acts violently towards her physicians and in a sexually aggressive manner. Dr. Klein. Yes, I'm Dr. Klein. This is Dr. Klein. I'm sure. I've gotten worse since I found you. I've been upstairs. Is she having spasms again? Yeah, but they've gotten violent. Did you give her the medication you gave it? Yes. What was that? Because I was riddling. Chris, doctors. Doctors, I'm ready! speak through the bottom. What was going on in there? How could she fly off the bed like that? Pathological states. Can induce abnormal strength. Accelerated motor performance. And for example, say a 90 pound woman sees her child pinned under the wheel of a truck, runs out and lifts the wheels a half a foot up off the ground. You've heard the story. Same thing here. Same principle, I mean. So what's wrong with it? We still think the temporal low. Oh, what are you talking about, for Christ's sakes? Did you see her or not? She's acting like she's fucking out of her mind, psychotic, like a, a split personality or what? <laughs> The doctor
doctors respond by insisting their original diagnosis is correct, at which point an exasperated Chris shouts at them that this can't possibly be right. Yet following this outburst, the new doctor calmly folds his arms and pejoratively explains to Chris that there have only been a handful of cases of split personality disorder and insists that any reasonable psychiatrist would first rule out any bodily cause for the ailment. The next step, another spinal tap. <laughs> to which Chris swears, oh Christ. And just as before in the angiography, we see the same pained expressions with no results. Since I press for time, I will not address the hypnosis scene, which follows the same pattern. Rather, I now note that as the doctors exit with the vague advice of seeking an exorcism, this is when Reagan undergoes a startling transformation. Her face is transformed, she masturbates with a crucifix, telekinetically moves objects, and her head spins 180 degrees as she imitates the voice of a dead man. In short, it is only after the doctors leave the picture that Reagan's case becomes overtly supernatural. Interestingly enough, when Karis is brought in, he adopts the same position as the doctors. Instead of a physiological disturbance, Karis seems to latch onto the theory that Reagan is suffering from multiple personality disorder. It is not until he is directly confronted with an unexplainable phenomenon that he becomes convinced of Reagan's possessed state. Let us pray. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, once and for all, consign that fallen tyrant to the flames of hell, who sent your only begotten son into the world to crush that roaring lion, to hasten to our call for heaven, and snatch from you a nation bound from the clutches of the noonday devil, and this human being, taking your image and likeness. Strike terrible into the beast, now laying waste to your life. Stepping back from this detailed analysis, we might ask how this repeated cinematic message changes the film's core message. That is, Blatty has been explicit that his book and Friedkin's movie were meant to restore faith. By Blatty's reasoning, if the devil exists, so too must God. While one could certainly argue that the film accomplishes this, it does so by depleting the diagnostic authority of the medical establishment. For faith to be restored, the demon must speak, and for the demon to speak, the authority of an organization that it denies its very existence must be abrogated. Moreover, as we have already said, Reagan is not distinguished or special in any way. As Friedkin notes in an interview on the fear of God making the exorcist, the film is about, quote, a real street in a real town with real people living in it, in the house, and upstairs, on the third floor of this house, is a real little girl who happens to be possessed by a demon. To put it a different way, the film is about an ordinary person who happens to be possessed. Her mother, another ordinary person, eventually rejects the mistaken diagnoses of the ordinary doctors and goes to a priest for an exorcism. All of this occurs while the ordinary people in the audience are watching and identifying with the struggles of these two principal characters. Though we might not think so at first watch, The Exorcist is really a medical drama about the choices and care an ordinary mother makes for her ordinary daughter. This conclusion is reinforced by commentary by Batty and Blair, both of whom, contrary to what we might expect, claim that it was not the scenes of The Exorcism that provoked such visceral reactions from the audience, but the medical scenes themselves. In Blair's words, those scenes where they have all the tubes coming out and so on and so forth, that really, really gets to people. Even as, as I have just seen it get to the members of this audience, an audience with little to no context for the zeitgeist of the 70s. 
So at this point, we've analyzed why the film may have compelled individuals to seek out exorcisms, and what I would argue is the driving force behind the film and subgenre's continued popularity. That is, that it's basically Grey's Anatomy, but with demons. <laughs> Certainly, this is not to dismiss a host of other factors that influence the success of the film, and which other scholars prior to me have rightly pointed out. For example, the twin constellation of Watergate and Vietnam that caused the loss of faith in American political structures, um, the Back to God movement inside the United States, the sort of perception of the depletion of the American family, etc., etc. But now I wish to move on to the reactions to the film. The first three groups that I discuss, film reviewers, lay populists, and religious professionals, I will keep necessarily brief, as they are largely unsurprising and simply window dressing for the fourth. Instead, I would like to focus much of my time on the reactions of the fourth group, the medical establishment, particularly those portions engaged in treating mental health. It is this fourth overlooked group that suggests The Exorcist has transcended its influence in pop culture and begun to influence professional discourse in mental health. Many reviewers pan the production. <coughs> the Exorcist is the trash bombshell of 1973, Michael Dempsey writes in Film Quarterly, the aesthetic equivalent of being run over by a truck. Quote, The Exorcist rates high on the list of phenomena not to be taken seriously. It should be filed under midwinter madness, claims Eugene Kennedy of the New York Times in the same year and forgotten as soon as possible by all literate and mature people. Discussing the movie seriously gives it an importance that of itself it does not observe, it does not to deserve. At the same time, many reviewers also noted the powerful influence that the film had upon theater goers of the time. Kenneth Woodward writes in Newsweek in 1974 that, quote, in Berkeley, California, a crazed customer charged the screen in a vain effort to get the demon. In nearby Anaheim, a Pentecostal clergyman was staying up nights to exercise fearful viewers of The Exorcist. He quotes two cinema managers regarding the film, quote, my, my janitors are going bananas wiping up the vomit. That's a lot of vomit. And two, we've had two to five people faint here every day since this picture opened. More men than women pass out. Of course, this is not statistical data, nor is there any forthcoming, so we have no idea how many people out of the total number of filmgoers responded in such a pronounced fashion. Yet one possible barometer for the frequency of these claims are the writings of religious professionals. While this picture is similarly skewed, i.e. many individuals wrote, but certainly not all did, the publication of such material in trade journals bespeaks more effort than offhandedly mentioning such material in a review or article. In the wake of the film, John Warwick Montgomery, then professor-elect of law and theology at the International School of Law in DC, lays out the case for exorcism in his article in Christianity Today, Exorcism, Is It For Real? George Saxonmeyer in 1976 wrote an article entitled Approaching the Ministries of Healing and Exorcism, Methodologies for Approach, whose stated purpose was, quote, to explore and discuss real life experiences <coughs> or situation in which this writer has observed where demonic powers had apparently been at play or active in the life of a person discussed in this treatment. In 1977, Donald Oman likens exorcism to marriage counseling, <laughs> exorcism and adjunct to Christian counseling, suggesting that exorcism has become somewhat normative for the writer. For my purposes, though, I am most interested in the effect that the film had upon the practice of psychology itself. To analyze this, I divide the fourth group into four categories, loosely based upon possible relationships between indigenous healers and psychotherapists in Pattison's work, Exorcism as Psychotherapy. The first, which I assume to be the majority, is the group of medical professionals who either dismissed the film or were largely unimpacted by it. That is, there was no way in which the exorcist required them to reassess their discipline. This roughly corresponds to Pattison's category of total separation and seems best illustrated by Don Cupid's commentary on W.H. Trethillon's article on exorcism in the Journal of Medical Ethics. Quote, on ethical grounds, I think exorcism should not be performed. On intellectual grounds, I think it has no place in modern medicine. And I deplore the suggestion that psychiatrists might recommend certain patients to priests for exorcism, which they did after the film. For that proposal suggests an intolerable view of the relations of religion and science. The second group represents Pattinson's competitive model, a model in which the mental health practitioner acknowledges the analogous practice, but asserts the, superior, uh, the superiority of his or her own practice. Specifically, here we encounter the offhanded acknowledgement by some members of the psychological community outside professional journals. For example, Ralph Greenson writes in the Saturday Review, quote, 
The Exorcist is a menace, the most shocking major movie I have ever seen. Never before have I witnessed such a flagrant com combination of perverse sex, brutal violence, and abused religion. In addition, the film degrades the medical profession and psychiatry. He then goes on to describe how he was forced to treat two patients who believed themselves to be possessed or hounded by the devil in the wake of the film. Trithoen's work in the Journal of Medical Ethics falls into this competitive model as well. He argues that doctors should be concerned with the growing practice of exorcism for three reasons. One, that the practice is not as extinct as some might like to believe. Two, in order to ensure that patients do not fall into the wrong therapeutic hands. And three, perhaps most interesting for our case, quote, because there is no doubt that the roots of modern psychopathology are to be found in medieval demonology and in the ideas contained in the literature of the period, there should be an awareness that these ideas are not yet wholly irrelevant. It is precisely this analogy upon which Don Cupid calls out Trithone in the comments. Quote, Professor Trithone illustrates the acute philosophical difficulties raised by the revival of exorcism by an ambiguity in his own attitude, an ambiguity which is widely shared nowadays. The third group corresponds to Pattison's collaborative relationship in which psychiatric practitioners establish their practice in non-hierarchical continuation with the historical practice of exorcism. That is, they see themselves as equivalents. As we dip into the issue of collaboration, we begin to enter a somewhat surreal landscape. Here it is sometimes unclear what sort of uneasy accord has been struck between diabolism and a psychiatry. On the one hand, we have authors such as Derek Russell Davis, who writes in the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine that exorcism may be an effective treatment because it leads to reconciliation and readmission into fellowship, much as the therapeutic practice of abreaction does. Um, he notes, in fact, that it may be an early form of abreaction therapy. As a side note that attests to the popular conversation, this one was from a symposium on exorcism and psychology in 1977. That is, there were several papers <coughs> on this subject. On the other is Alan Geddes, who asks and answers in Psychotherapy as Exorcism, quote, is, psycho 